Welcome back everybody, this is Eric here at the Iraq Veteran 8888. We have taken a special field trip today and we have wound up in the midst of Mr. Mark Novak, Anvil Gunsmithing, CN Arsenal, you guys are probably familiar with this content. And we always relish an opportunity to check out some really unique weapons. In this case, a really interesting little shotgun here. Mm -hmm. Let's talk about it a little bit. Somewhere from upstate New York, New Hampshire, we can't tell there's no markings on it, but a museum in New York sent me this, and we'll hear a little bit more about it later. It's a single shot, under hammer, takedown, 12 gauge shotgun. And why did I get it? Well, it had a broken mainspring, and let's just say that the wood was gray, and the metal was orange, and the gentleman that operates the museum didn't like gray and orange guns, so that's why I wound up with it. Uh, my new friend Eric here saw it back in the armory and went, what the heck is that? Can we shoot it? Of course we can shoot it. We've got to shoot it. <laughs> yeah, we've got to shoot it. But, you know, it's just got such an interesting aesthetic to it. You know, you've got this really thin, really thin wrist on this thing. I mean, you would think that it would just break under any kind of recoil forces. You know, and the stock is a very kind of classy straight comb with that really thin wrist. And that just really jumped out at me. And then Mark also made the... Uh, I guess the astute observation, if you will, that you could, in theory, use this thing as a handheld Derringer right. because you have your powder chamber here, your under hammer and cap, and your trigger all yeah. self-contained. So here's what I want you guys to remember. This is a one and a half pound 12 gauge. It's like pulling all five triggers on your 30-06. Yep. You know, there is no such thing as a free lunch in physics. No. So, you know what I mean? That power has to go somewhere. And when you're talking such a light little shotgun, mm -hmm. you know, uh, so we have, this is, you said this is Damascus or twist, twist steel? It's twist. Okay. It's twist. It's just a strip wound around a scalp all the way down. It's not, um, it's not patterned out. It's just a, it's wound around a scalp. So it's like welded on a mandrel, basically? Right. It's jump welded. You get it all nice and hot and you jump it this way and it all comes together and you basically hammer weld it using its own mass. Right. And you can you can see the pattern mm -hmm. of the twist. Well, now you can see the pattern. Right. Not when I got it. So it was a rust bucket before. It was, uh, yeah. It was hosed. You know, um, Mark is also the gentleman that handled all the work on the Kamalater. You guys have probably seen this videos. Um, and you notice that the Kamalater, actually right here, mm -hmm. is an underhammer as well. And this is also an underhammer. Mm -hmm. And I want to make an observation about the underhammer. You know, you can, you can agree or disagree, but the underhammer is neat because it doesn't obscure your sight picture. At all. You don't have a flash pan flashing in your face or a big fireball occurring near your face. Mm -hmm. And whether you're a left-handed or right-handed shooter, the underhammer provides the puff of smoke to go down and doesn't obscure your sight picture. Absolutely. So if you're in the field shooting, it just seems to me that it would be a much better field gun to have an underhammer. Right, and underhammers work on English and metric caps. Uh-huh. <laughs> <laughs> yep. Sorry. <laughs> Couldn't I, resist that one. I know, I know you couldn't. But that is just such a clever little design. And, uh, mm -hmm. you know, we really wanted to just show this off, and we are going to shoot it for you guys. And the big deal with an underhammer is, is that parts count is very, very low. There's not a lot of pieces in there. It's two pieces. It's the trigger, which is the sear. It's the hammer, and then the hammer spring is the sear spring. So it, 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 it would be, it's very, very simple, very, very low parts content. No trigger guard. All right. But... The guy that's carrying this thing isn't doing a lot of reps with it. He just wants to be armed with something major caliber when he's out and about. You know, something else that mm -hmm. you, you made the observation earlier mm -hmm. that you could, in theory, use this as, let's just say, a Derringer type arrangement. You know, if you were, I don't know, walking around back then and you stowed the barrel in your yeah. satchel or whatever, you mentioned that, yeah, we have the stock on here, but you, you could have made a pistol grip for yes. this thing. You wind up with a handgun. <laughs> and mm -hmm. you have a little miniature handgun you right. can carry in your vest pocket. It would be brutal to shoot that way, I'm going to tell you what. It right. would be brutal, but if it's all you got to save your life, then, you know, God made man, but Colonel Colt made him equal, right? Well, I mean, but the interesting thing about that is you mm -hmm. got that modularity. Yes. You know, people were thinking that way even they back were. then. They were serious and how, production how, one How time. old is this one? I would put this about 1840. 40, 1835, 1840, maybe into the 1850s. You gotta figure the percussion era didn't stick around long because it was not a major jump to go from um, primer, powder, ball to self-contained ammunition. It was not a major jump to go there. The percussion era only stuck around for about 40 years. So yeah, I would put it 1835, 40, 50 at the outstretch because right as you got into the Civil War in the 18, 1850s, 1850s. But I've got no way to date it. 
1850s. Let's a, see. a little gun like that very well could have, you know, fended off a stagecoach robber or a, uh, a rabid dog. More or likely, maybe put some food on more the table. likely that was hosing a gopher that was screwing up your turnips. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Walk around the say. garden and you see a little uh, critter. Yeah, yeah. Well, let's uh, let's go hose something with it. Yeah. Let's do that. All right, guys. We are actually going to shoot this little walking gun here, and we can see that the barrel threads onto the front of the receiver section. Okay. We've got it loaded with number eight shot with 60 uh, grains of 2F powder. And then that's our twist steel barrel. It's gonna thread back in place. So basically you would have a single shot Derringer without the stock and the barrel on this. It is an under hammer. All right, I'm gonna shoulder it. Mr. Novak's gonna cap it. Go ahead and go back to full cock. Keep going, right there, good. We are on full cock. It is an under hammer, guys. Yeah. We're just All being right. really, really careful here because we don't this trust is, it. This is a lightweight little shotgun, so yeah. we'll see what happens here to this uh, water jug here. <laughs> Woo, buddy! <laughs> that is such a cool little piece of hardware, guys. Uh, this uh, gun came out of a museum in Syracuse, New York, so they've been kind enough to allow us to test fire it. So to reload it, we would pull the barrel off, okay? And for cleaning purposes, obviously the barrel will come off, which is handy and then you would load it down the front just like a little Derringer. So very, very cool little little uh, shotgun, very lightweight. This would have been used uh, from everything for like riding around on a bicycle and shooting stray dogs or highwaymen, <laughs> whatever the, the case may be, but it was just meant to be a lightweight walking gun and this extremely light little setup. Uh, it does have a little bit of recoil, but you can see it'll definitely put some shot down range. Let's load it. We'll show you how it's loaded. We'll shoot it again. What we've got here on the bench is an upstate New York, Vermont, New Hampshire. It almost looks like a Wesson takedown. Um, this was brought in here because it needed to be conserved. It had a broken mainspring and it hadn't been taken apart in probably 120 years. I can't tell you who made it. What I can tell you is there's not a mark on it. We've looked everywhere for it. It's tight and it screws together. So as you can see, this is the ultimate takedown. The function of what we're gonna do right now is load this. So we're gonna pull the barrel off and this loads kind of like a Queen Anne screw barrel. You don't have to take the back end off, but I'm gonna tell you what, you unscrewed that, you've got yourself a handy little 12 gauge Derringer. Not the safest thing in the world, I would guess, but I'm gonna go ahead and leave the stock on it. So let me screw this back on again. Screwing it off, screwing it up, I don't know. All right, so let's hear it here. Let me put that back on. Something else I'll point out real quick is the hammer notches on this thing have been adulterated over the years, and I've got it running on, I've got a full cock in it. In order to get a half cock notch, I'd have to make a new hammer for it, and that's not where the owner's going. The owner wanted the wood to not be gray and wanted the metal to not be orange again, and then asked me, well, would you shoot it? Yes. So you'll see there'll be some precautions when we take it out and shoot it. It is a percussion under hammer gun. So I made a new spring for it. This is the powder chamber here. So I'm gonna drop down a little bit right there. And you load in a conventional manner that you would load most muzzle loading guns is we're gonna swing in. And if you guys wanna see a great description of loading black powder by volume instead of by weight, you need to get on over and watch some of the stuff that Eric and Chad did about that. Okay, here we go. So we're just gonna pour the gunpowder in the bottom. This is like loading a cartridge, propellant in the bottom. Then we're gonna take an over powder wad and we're gonna just stuff that down there. Then we're gonna take a vegetable oil lubricated felt cushion wad. And this keeps the shot column from being adulterated. Um, it just, it's just a, it's a shock absorber. And then out of my shot snake here, we're gonna take an ounce of shot. The cool piece of kit right there. It is. <laughs> So we're gonna take an ounce of shot out, and here we go, there's our shot. And we'll pour the shot in right over the top. Now for those of you guys that are used to a more modern approach to this, you'll note that the shot is actually touching the walls of the barrel. So these older guns that were fired with base cushion and over powder wads, the outer layer of shot beads is actually sliding up the barrel and having their outsides knocked off. And some of the pellets that emerge from the muzzle are not truly hemispherical. Uh, or spherical, not hemispherical, spherical. So what will happen is you'll get some flyers off the edge of the pattern, um, but at the end of the day, this is a pretty brutal thing. 
the wads I have are not exactly the right size here. So we're going to do that and I'm going to take a little bit of wax just because we're here on the bench and I'm just going to do just a little bit of wax because it'll lubricate anyway. And then this way, if we tip the muzzle down on our way out to go pop around, it, the, the, the wad's not going to fall out is what I'm looking at. So that's it. We never cap until we're absolutely ready to shoot this thing. Um, and right now we're not. And that way, if we have an oopsie daisy or this hammer decides to let go, we will have the oopsie daisy and it will let go outside. You have to be very careful to keep your fingers clear of the trigger. And we're going to cap here and I'll get my hands out of the way in a minute and show you what I did. So the cap is now on the nipple on the bottom. And I'm going to couch the gun. I'm going to put the stock up underneath my arm because I don't want to stress this joint anymore. We're operating this gun. We're not shooting it. And it's still, I'm going to tell you what, it operates like a regular gun. It, it's got a lot of power to it. All right, boys and girls, that's been our little 1850s walking gun, uh, possibly from New York, possibly from <laughs> that yeah, area. Sure, somewhere up in there, yeah, <laughs> upstate. What a neat little little shotgun, yes. you know. Outstanding, absolutely. Yeah. Uh, pleasure, and thanks for coming on down, and I really, really like to have you here in the shop, man. Um, absolutely. You know, I'm sensing um, oysters in our future. Yes, yeah. oysters in the future for sure. We don't have to kill those. We just crack them and there they go. Yeah, but well, I guess we do technically But it would them. be imminently more gratifying to hose them with this thing, wouldn't it? Yeah, I don't know. <laughs> if you'd really have much left over of an oyster if you'd have that shotgun. No, my wife would be a little pissed too. That's right. Yeah, yeah guys, uh, anytime we're up here, we'd like to hang out with him and, and just check out some of the cool stuff that he's got laying around. We love older firearms and it's so much fun to see the history behind these old things. And, and also, I think that there's a lot of validity in keeping these old guns running. It's mm -hmm. an honorable thing, right? Because if these guns languish away into nothing, then their stories kind of get lost, you know what I mean? So I think it's important to preserve these old pieces and to let people enjoy them. And that's why we love to document these kind of things, because maybe you guys learned something you didn't know uh, about, or maybe now you know that something like this exists, and without a guy like Mark to preserve these things, you know, then they wouldn't be around for people to enjoy or even know yeah. about. So I think it's an important part of firearms technology to see these types of things. I mean, it takes a lot to blow my skirt up, and you would think that with it being, it's a, it's a simple shotgun, right? But it's very cool, you know, it's well thought out. Big bore black powder guy. That's right. Big time. I mean, very this, much. I mean, this he's, he's big into the whole face paint thing. Yeah. That's right, yeah. Yeah. That's right. Awesome. Guys, make sure that you subscribe to the Anvil uh, YouTube channel and also make sure you subscribe to CN Arsenal. Those guys really put in some great work. They put out wonderful content. Uh, if this sort of thing interests you, make sure you follow them over there. Mark, thanks for letting us come out and hang out, man. Hoorah. All right.